2022 is halfway done and to kick off the second half we have six new refines for update 6.7. Today we'll be talking about Pan, Mordecai, Chao, Volumerita, Bridal Fjorm, and Legendary Roy. We'll discuss what these new refines do and what playstyle builds can pair with them. First off we have Pan, a Heroic Grail Blue Beast Cavalry unit. Her toggle Fang is largely unchanged but got some new base effects. It's effective against cavalry foes and if Pan is solo or next to a beast or dragon ally, she gets plus 4 to all stats during combat and also if the foe is not a beast or dragon, she gets an additional plus 4 to all stats and inflicts guard on the foe. Tago Fang's old stat boost got bumped up from plus 3 to plus 4 and now Pan gets more stats with guard. Very good stuff, however she doesn't get these perks if she fights a beast or dragon enemy. That is kind of a bummer and because guard is really good for initiations and it synergizes with the cavalry beast mini impact bonus when transformed. Despite this, Togo Fang has an impressive refine. At start of combat, if unit has more than 25% HP, grants another plus for all stats and the falling effect if Pan has more speed than the enemy. If she outspeeds by one or more, she gets a follow up attack. If it's five or more, she deals plus seven true damage per hit. Altogether, Togo Fang provides plus 12 wall stats, plus 7 damage on hit, and a makeshift flow guard. A free follow up attack can cancel out follow up prevention skills, and then pan out speeds to double. With plus 12 defense and res, guard, and the impact follow up prevention when transformed, pan has a lot of extra safety to attack with. She doesn't have the best base defense and res, and her low base attack is boosted with extra damage, however, you need to win some speed checks. You do lose some stats and guard against beast or dragon enemies. You also need to remember that Togo's Fang uh, base effect does not work at all if Pan is next to a human when fighting. Generally, this is fine, but it's another condition that may mess you up. Overall, this is still a solid refine, but depending on your team and enemy composition, Pan may get tripped up. These builds on screen may look a bit familiar, because they are. Pan's stats and her refine are not that different from Ranolf. She's another beast unit who can make great use of the attack speed catch 4, spinning defense near trace and speed smoke 4 setup. You got tons of stats, Kanto, and for the enemy phase you get dodge. Pan needs to focus on speed for her refine, so dodge damage reduction is nice, and again it works well with the catch A skills. You could say having guard is actually better than Ranulf's extra damage, but again, Pan has conditions to meet. Ranulf plays nicely with human allies just fine, but Pan has to avoid them completely, and enemy beast or dragons turn off some of her stats and guard. Easy use is something to consider in actual gameplay. Now for other skills, well Pan already has some solid perks thanks to her refine. She can use solo skills since it's part of her weapon if you do run with humans. Preferably you want Pan transformed for initiations. If you do have Kanto, or if you don't have Kanto, then Lulz, Desperation, and Windsweep can all work. Windsweep's a little clunky here because Toggle's Fang's uh, free follow-up cancels out Windsweep's penalty, but that means enemy follow-up denial skills will just stop your double. One big benefit Pan has or would love is cooldown reduction. But just like Ranulf, her only option is Heavy Blade. 29 base attack despite all the extra stats from the refine is still going to be kind of sketchy. If you want to run something like Gale Force though, then you don't really have a choice. Overall, for a free unit, this is still a very good refine. Beast units cannot run Flow Guard, so even having a budget version of it is really good. You do need to focus on speed, but Pan probably should be doing that anyway. If you do not have a lot of beast units, Pan continues to be very free to play friendly. She is literally the only beast cavalier that is not 5 star locked. Next up we have Mordecai, a blue beast infantry unit, continuing the beast refined trend. His saber tooth fang did also not really get changed from before. It grants a flat plus 3 defense and if the movement assist skill is used by or targets Mordecai, inflict minus 5 doll stats on foes within 2 spaces through their next actions after movement. At start of combat, if the foe is more than 75% HP, grant plus 5 attack and defense during combat. So basically, this effect got buffed from minus 4 to minus 5 debuffs, and Mordecai gets some attack and defense for himself. He will also get the new Beast Infantry Transformation bonus, which again is tempo and plus 7 damage on special trigger. Further refine, if a movement assist is used or targets Mordecai, inflict special cooldown count plus 1 on foes within 2 spaces of Mordecai and his ally. If unit is within 3 spaces of any ally, grant plus 5 attack and defense during combat again. Okay, so unlike Ranulf, Mordecai does lean into his support weapon more. Not only does it emit minus 5 debuffs around Mordecai and his ally after using movement skills, but it now inflicts plus 1 special count, aka this is like pulse smoke. Being able to walk back enemy specials can be very clutch if the enemy is trying to abuse skills like times pulse, infantry pulse, or perhaps dual crom. You need to be smart with movement, but this is a rather unique ability, and it's on a demoted unit. 
that alone is pretty cool. Now for personal combat, you'll notice Mordecai very much falls in that slow but high attack and defense category, plus attack and defense only solidifies that further, and speed and res kinda just get forgotten. If you need a physical damage wall, Mordecai can step in despite only getting basic stat boost for combat. Obviously, this refined strength is entirely dependent on how you utilize Mordecai. Generally, he uses Smite to push teammates two spaces forward. This is because you need to be within two spaces of the enemy to even debuff them with Sabretooth Fang. In addition to debuffs, uh, now Mordecai can uncharge specials if need be. This supportive playstyle is what makes Mordecai stand out, and you can lean more into it if you want. He already has Attack and Evens Link because after smiting, Attack and Evens Link will, debar, will buff the ally and Mordecai. If you want to buff from across the map, you could run cross spurs. That's an interesting choice, especially for if you want to stack attack. As for teammates who smite or push around, any debuff user is good. Things like pledge and weapons would be great, and in the ephemera shop this month, we are getting the Broadleaf Fan Dagger. Imagine you smite your Broadleaf Fan user forward, you get them to debuff the enemy, and they can use those debuffs for more damage. Maybe they could have Kanto if they're a cavalry or flying dagger user. Kanto in general just works nicely with Sabretooth Fang, especially if it's Kanto remaining. Now, if you want Mordecai himself to get dirty, well, with low speed and no help from his refine, it's pretty hard to push him into player phase initiations. Most likely, you're just gonna have to wait and bait enemies to attack you on the enemy phase. If you're fine with that, you could do something like Quick Repulse plus Steady Breath. You could also do things like Times Pulse, Steady Breath, and Bonfire to counter instantly with special. Remember, when transformed, Mordecai is gonna get Temple, so he has no guard and he gets plus seven extra damage for bonfire procs. It's a fun burst setup and you could run it with things like distant foil or for full attack and even stacking. For other skills, you could go with Sturdy Stance 3, Attack and Defense Unity, or Low Attack and Defense plus Quick Repose. If you wanted support options, Mordecai has high base HP, so he can run Sudden Panic, Panic Ploy, or an Infantry Pulse skill of his own. Panic stacks with debuffs, so it's a nice complement to Sabretooth Fang. All in all, Mordecai is still a solid smite enforcer if you're gonna need those divas. His range is not the biggest, so you need to position well, but he also has pulse smoke for fast charging specials. If a fight gets messy with multiple units surviving, Mordecai might be able to open up an attack if you can uncharge an enemy special. The guard status can't do that. Interesting ability for sure, and it's gonna keep Mordecai somewhat unique. Next we have Chow's Heartbeat Lance, which is a brand new weapon. Chow has a Lance Armored Unit, so you already know what playstyle builds are coming. Heartbeat Lance has 16 might and on refine grants plus 3 HP, which would be relevant. At start of combat, if unit has more than 25% HP, inflict minus 5 attack and defense on the foe during combat and prevent a follow up attack. Extremely basic and simple. For the refine, if foe initiates combat or the foe has more than 75% HP at sight of combat, inflict minus 5 attack and defense on the foe and reduce foe's attack by X% percent of foe's attack at sight of combat. X is equal to the number of Chow's base stats that are greater than the foe's stats at sight of combat times 5 and you add a flat plus 10 at the end. Do not let this refine intimidate you, this is actually a really simple combat effect in the end result. It's fall prevention, defense debuffs, and two attack debuffs, that's all this actually is. Now calculating this second attack debuff is what looks complicated. I'm assuming base stats in this context refers to visible on the field stats. So field buffs and debuffs are included and everything uses stats at start of combat, meaning no in combat buffs are included. If Chow has higher stats in all five categories, that's five times five to get 25 plus 10. The second attack debuff equates to 35% of the foe's attack stats. Now realistically, Cho probably loses the speed check against most attackers, and it's definitely possible to lose that res check. This means generally if you focus on HP, attack, and defense, she should win 3 checks, so that's something like 15% plus 10, and that equals to 25% reduced attack. As an example, if the foe has 60 attack at start of combat, 25% of that equals 15. Minus 10 attack and defense plus another minus 15 attack gets you a gigantic minus 25 attack total debuff. Yikes. Now let's say Chow loses all 5 checks. She still reduces the foe's attack by 10%. With 60 attack, that's only minus 6 attack, so minus 16 attack total. Still pretty big. 
It should be absolutely clear that there is zero damage reduction going on here. Heartbeat Lance just combines two attack debuffs. Like with any stat checking weapon, flat stat increases are beneficial. That means merges, summoning support, mythic blessings, dragon flowers, field buzz debuffs, game mode stat boost, whatever you can get that is visible on the field. You just need to win by one or more. Now, the question with any Lance army in it is Shell better than Brave Hector? I'm gonna say probably not, but I'm very unsure where to place this weapon and how many people even have infested shells at all. In terms of playstyle and builds, all of our armor refines are getting pretty samey because save skills continue to be super strong. Literally just go full enemy phase, you block attacks for your team, and you don't die. Again, Heartbeat Lance is ridiculously simple, fall prevention, minus 10 attack and defense, and another attack debuff depending on how many base stats Chell has higher than the foe. If you want to run a save build, you can go with the standard tier 3 dual stance, quick repose armor B skill, near or far save, and a sacred seal like steady breath. No matter what you build, guard would be really nice because specials are going to be the big burst to get by Heartbeat Lance's debuffs. However, a lot of units can bypass fall prevention, a lot of strong attackers have no guard. In these cases, it might just be better to accept you're gonna get doubled and you're gonna eat a special. To counter this, you can bring damage reduction in the form of defensive specials and hardy fighter. Chao will have to use a 2 cooldown option, but 30% is better than nothing. Unfortunately, her killing power is not that high outside of pure one shot, and unlike Brave Hector, you don't get a free follow up attack quicker pose. If you, oh, if you go Hardy Fighter and you do not get the KO, you may not recharge your special for a second battle. Now, let's discuss using flat stat boosters. The most likely option is Fortress Defense and Res 3 plus 6 Defense and Res, but minus 2 attack. Is that worth it? Great for winning the defense check and perhaps going to be getting you a, a res check win, but attack checks are becoming tougher and tougher to keep up with. To be honest, I think getting another effect like Guard of Unity is more valuable nowadays. Remember, you can use field buffs and debuffs to win this stat check, I believe, and that would be better instead of messing with the flat stat boosters. For other skills, Chow does have the defense res Aetherade's defense skill, so maybe it's worth keeping. She also has Bold Fighter, which is still good, but it's just not that the air, it's just that the Heartbeat Lance doesn't really scream for a player phase build. I definitely think enemy phase is still the way to go, and of course save skills just feed into that playstyle. Overall, this is a strange refine. I honestly feel like it kind of is an alternative to damage reduction effects because we have more things to counter that. You can't exactly disable an attack debuff, it's just flat numbers. Moving on, our next refine is for Fallen Merida and her Shadow Sword. She is a speedy sword master, so what does she bring to the table? This is another weapon that got buffed to its old effect. It excites specials, and at the start of combat, if Merida has more than 25% HP, she gets plus 5 attack and speed, and if she initiates combat, she can make a follow-up attack before the foe can counter. Shadow Sword got its HP requirement dropped from 50% to 25%, so more flexibility. It still gives Merida desperation when healthy, and now it grants plus 5 attack and speed. The refine is simple, but pretty crazy. If the foe has more than 75% HP, Marita gets another plus 5 attack and speed, and no guard. If the foe has more speed than defense, Marita inflicts minus 8 speed on them. If they have more defense than speed, she inflicts minus 8 defense instead. So, tallying things up, plus an attack and speed, and against faster enemies, Marita knocks them down with a big minus 8 speed debuff. This is like having 18 speed on an already very fast unit. However, against tanky enemies, Marita inflicts minus 8 defense, so that's like having plus 18 attack. Her base attack is certainly low compared to modern sword units, so this damage boost is appreciated, but Marita has no guard and excited specials to make up for it. With desperation to instantly 2 tap people with potential special proc, Marita is a deadly player phase unit if he cannot match her speed. Shadow Swords Refine works really well with Fallen Marita's base kit. First off, no follow up pairs with Desperation, so if Mar Marita outspeeds at all, she will W instantly. Second, Flashing Blade 4 with no guarding search specials means Marita can proc Luna on her second hit, or she can get Guilford's going in two hits. This is guaranteed to happen unless the enemy brings no special charge. Of course, with all the speed Marita gets with this refined Flashing Blade should be an easy activation. You actually don't need Flashing Blade for certain builds, aka Vital Astra. Ascended Marita brought Vital Astra with her and, no surprise, Fallen Marita can use it well, although not as well as her near alt. 
Regardless, two cooldown plus times pulse accelerated specials means this Marita can pre-charge Vital Astra to get the dodge effect. Obviously, the damage boost based on speed is very good, and with no guard, Marita can proc Vital Astra on hit number one, then hit number two guarantees it gets recharged. You need to keep it charged to retain dodge, so it's very good to have. If you can run Vital Astra, you don't need Flash and Blade 4. Search Barrel or Attack and Speed Solo are good replacements, and you could also run a low B skill, but I suggest keeping No Fault to synergize with uh, Shadow Sword's Desperation effect. It's just too good. In terms of dodge skills like Spurn or other fun Swordmaster builds like Distant Counter, I would say Fallen Marita can pull them off, but she's not purposefully geared for it. Shadow Swords are fine, and the base effect itself is geared to player phase. If you wanted a dodge tank with things like Distant Dart, the new Ascendant Marita is better. She has no follow up on her weapon, which is more flexible for more mixed phase setups. Last thing I want to mention is the new Attack and Speed Oath 4C skill on the upcoming Summer Erica. First off, the buffs go to plus 6 attack and speed, and it works within two spaces of an ally instead of being adjacent. It also grants the warp status, and if you fight within two spaces of an ally, you get an additional plus 3 attack and speed er er during combat. Unlike Rouse 4C skills, the Oath 4 skills got hilarious buffs, bonus warping could be nice for tricky initiations, and Marita does not mind more attack and speed. Overall, super solid to find for Shadow Sword, it sticks to being player phase focused, and things like No Guard and the new Vital Astra special are great tools for Fallen Marita. In a very competitive speed battle, Marita has plus 18 speed from her weapon alone, on top of her still amazing photon base speed, that's quite a lot. Don't underestimate her if you try to throw down at hyper speeds. Our fifth season of Refine goes to Bride of Yarn, very interesting flying healer for her unique support usage. Her Yellow Bruce Staff was already good, so it just got a quality of life buff, 14 Might, Wrathful Staff, and at start of turn, if Yarn has one more HP than foes in current directions of her, she inflicts isolation on them. All that changed was the HP check went from 3 or more HP to just 1. For those not familiar, isolation is a status effect that prevents the user from using or being the target of assist skills. This means no dancing, no healing, no reposition, no rallies, and so on. Very powerful status for things like Aether Raids where Deven's teams can abuse dancers or rally traps or just being able to reposition someone backwards. There are very little sources of isolation in the game, so Bridal Farm is very unique and special. Now for the refine, Fjorm grants plus 4 attack and speed and neutralizes penalties for allies within 2 spaces during combat. If she's within 3 spaces of any ally herself, she gets the same plus 4 attack and speed boost during combat. So you can kind of think of this like joint drive attack and joint drive speed, but Fjorm also gets rid of stat debuffs. That part is only for her teammates. Neutralizing debuffs is not always useful, but when it works, it can be super impactful and I believe it's a very clutch ability. For example, all those Plegian or Vulture weapons that depend on debuffs, they get completely stopped. That Broadly fan which is in the Ephemera shop this month is worthless if debuffs get neutralized. Now, one thing to remember is that neutralizing stat penalties also messes up unity effects, so do not pair the two together. OG Fjorm had this exact problem. Generally speaking, Bridal Fjorm's row is still the same, but she's an even better supporter now. Isolation is really powerful, but requires stacking HP, which means you don't really have a choice of A skill or Sacred Seal if you take double HP boosting skills. The best A skill option is Colorless Dual Flying 4, but that's rare and using it on a healer for arena score may not be for you. Fjorm's default HP and speed 2 is fine, or just go with HP plus 5. Fjorm also has Dazzling Staff, so she can attack safely, and she has decent base attack and speed, plus an extra plus 4 from the Refine. She isn't really a nuke, but if you need some colors magic damage, then Fjorm can help out. Her last base kit skill is Ground Orders, and that's another fine skill. Team mobility is great, and you have the option to swap to other flying mobility skills. One thing that may be fun is a movement healer assist like Nudge to push a teammate forward. Maybe you can use it to take advantage of isolation. If you want to stack buffs for teammates, you can throw in more drives, joint drive attack or speed, gold flyers, distant guard. The choice is up to you. Last for fun, healers can run cat skills and oath buffs. If you want Fjorm to do damage, you can use attack and speed catch 4 and the previously mentioned attack and speed oath 4. For sacred seals, they can also run blade session and attack and speed solo. Since we're screwing around, there's also far trace for Kanto, why not? Basically, Bridal Fjorm does her job better than before. She keeps her very unique isolation niche intact, and she adds some special team support and allied debuff neutralization. 
if you picked up that Bridal Fjarm Forma from way back when, I think you just got some extra value out of that Forma Soul. And last up is Legendary Roy, another Sword Inventory who also got a remix which we will cover in this video. First up, Dragon Bind received no changes because it has Distant Counter and Dragon Effectiveness. For the refined portion and start of combat, if Roy has 125% HP, he gets plus 4 to all stats, special charge plus 1 per attack, and no guard. DC with basically steady breath and no guard, not bad at all. From his stats, Roy has decent speed, but then spreads everything else out somewhat evenly, not super high attack, nor defense or res. Plus for all stats is nice, but is that enough for distant counter tanking? Well, Human Virtue 2 adds some more combat perks. First up, the original version of the skill got changed to buff Roy and allies within two spaces with plus 6 attack and speed. Legendary Roy hates dragons and beasts though, so he does not buff them up. For part 2, grants bonus to Roy's stats during combat equal to the highest bonus on allies within two spaces, calculates each stat independently, and again, no beast or dragons. This effect is literally OG Erica's refined Siglin. Roy buffs his team with plus 6 attack and speed, then this effect gives Roy back another plus 6 attack and speed during combat. Now for part 3, reduce damage from foe's first attack during combat by x%, percent. x is equal to the total value of bonuses on the 3 allies with the highest bonus totals within 2 spaces. As expected, no beast or dragons. Max of 40% damage reduction. So if Roy buffs 3 allies with plus 6 attack and speed, that's a total of 12 field buffs times 3, so 36% damage reduction. He can almost max it out just with human virtue, but to take full advantage of the second portion of this uh, of this skill, you ideally still want defense and res field buffs anyway. If you can buff 2 allies with full plus 6 field buffs, that gets Roy to 40% damage reduction. That's a bit easier to play around because otherwise you need 3 nearby allies. Overall, Legend of Roy is encouraged to use Distant Counter for his enemy phase playstyle, he improves his attack and speed buffs, feeds off his team's buffs, and he gets damage reduction. However, keep in mind Roy needs those teammates within two spaces, he cannot go off on his own, which further encourages the enemy phase playstyle. As part of his remix, Legendary Roy receives Spurn 3 for free in the B slot, dodge damage reduction means a focus on speed and the potential for some bonus damage on specials when on low HP. That's great with the refined cooldown reduction. For those that do not want to spend big on skills, Roy comes with bonus doubler in the A slot and we're getting a bonus doubler sacred seal on the Tempest Trials. If you want, you can stack these and go all in on field buff heavy team. Our human virtue will give Roy plus 6 attack speed. 2 bonus double skills gives plus 12 attack and speed, and Human Virtue can borrow plus 6 attack and speed from Roy's allies. With the plus 4 from Dragon Bind, you can amass plus 28 attack and speed, and if you give Roy and his team defense from his field buffs, you can actually get plus 28 to all stats. That's a bit wild, however, the issue with bonus doubler is that lulls hard counter them. In theory, bonus doubler can give you some of the highest total stats out of one skill. Roy gets tons of speed for Spurn's dodge, and he's allowed to tank your Ingenio to tank and spank attackers. If you get lulled though, you're screwed. But this build literally requires nothing to put together, just bring someone who can bring or give defensive field buffs to everyone on your team. While Spurn is fun, Roy lacks no follow-up, which is a staple sword infantry skill. Damage reduction is good, but preventing doubles and being able to bypass follow-up denial is huge. The good Swordmaster units combine both. Uh, Roy can use da or Human Virtue for damage reduction, but it's also possible to look for units who give the no follow-up status. For example, Legendary Melt Violet has his AoE no follow-up status for teammates. Roy would be a great benefactor of this, and that Violet kind of dunks on Beast and Dragons as a bonus. If you rather use no follow-up, Roy could try getting damage reduction via Vital Astra. It's not actually too bad for him. With extra special charge and no guard, one hit will actually charge Vital Astra for the counterattack, and it would leave it recharged for Roy's next battle if he doubles. That would mean Vital Astra's damage reduction is now active, so Roy, or while Roy can't do it on turn one, he might be able to sneak it in for future fights. Not related, but let's discuss some A skills. Tag Speed Unity is interesting because as a field buff user, Roy is weak to panic. Unity can basically negate panic for two stats, and it's nice that distant or it's nice with distant counter. If you want an A skill that is flexible on positioning, there is attack and speed ideal four, attack and speed bond four neutralizes attack and speed deals. Casual stance gives you guard, and this might work with spurn. You may get hit twice by slower units, but guard hopefully stops the special proc, and then you just let damage reduction do the work. 
unless there is Attack and Speed solo. The Secret 2 version could also work too, but Attack and Speed form might be better considering Human Virtue already requires nearby allies. In conclusion, Legendary Roy is sort of the opposite to Fallen Merida, who we discussed earlier. Merida is very much a player face sword infantry, while Roy is baiting enemies in with Distant Counter. Roy can stack a good bit of stats if his team gets involved, and generally, you need them to fully shine. Lulz and Panic will hamper Roy's stat stacking, but he has good special cooldown perks. I don't see Legendary Roy really taking over more than any other strong sword infantry, but he's a nice team buffer, and his distant counter playstyle is really easy to use. Spurn is a good addition, and the budget bonus double stacking could be fun to mess around with. Considering he has a distant counter weapon, I would say decent refine plus remix. However, I definitely feel like Roy could have gotten one or two more effects, like no panic or something. That's all I got for this video. Let me know your thoughts on these new refines and please share your own builds and ideas with everyone in the comments. Personally, I don't have any standard refines I must have this or this month, but I'm kind of tempted to mess around with Roy and the upcoming bonus Delver Sacred Seal. Maybe I'll just try him out with his remix scale and spurn. Up next, we're going to be breaking down the second summer banner. I'm excited for some more Sacred Stones units, so hope to see you there.